So I approach what we're going to be talking about tonight from a little bit of a different perspective, um, from an elder's perspective, uh, what I would want for my church and our ministry. So what we're going to talk about this evening is building God's way in S&B Construction Group. Building God's way is a, it has a network of kingdom building services that we offer to the church. So what you're going to hear tonight is just who we are, what we do, why we do it, and does it resonate with your ministry? And is there anything that we offer that you as, as, a, as a ministry say, you know, I think we want to hear more about that. It's not about signing contracts tonight or trying to get you to do something tonight. This is an information meeting. This is just me sharing with you folks about what we do and how we do it. So we'll get right into it. I think what we do with Building God's Way is we, we try to integrate biblical principles through outreach, relationship, and stewardship as it relates to design and construction and impacting the kingdom of God in your community. You'll find that we are Christ-centered, we're stewardship focused, we engage the ministry through everything that we do, we assimilate our best team to serve your ministry, we bring over 600 years of combined expertise and experience to your ministry. And by that I mean, if you took everyone together that works at Building God's Way and works at SMB Construction Group, we have over 600 years of experience that we bring to the church. We have collaborative uh, design process, pastoral input. We're a nationwide company. So we have builder partners like myself. I'm the builder. So if you say, hey, we want you to design something for us, I'm going to build it. But we have 25 builders like, like myself all across America. So we're hearing from pastors across the country of what's working and what's going on in their ministry. And we're able to bring that to you. We have leader uh, leadership team collaboration. We hear from leadership teams all over the country. And we're a national network of builders. Building God's Way has designed over 700 ministries nationwide. We only design churches, Christian schools, and Christian colleges. Dan Cook is our founder. He started it back in, uh, in 95 when he moved his family from Montana to Ogden, Utah. And the answer to your first question is we are not Mormon just because we're in Utah. We have over 700 ministry designs, over a billion dollars in constructive ministry facilities. We have a complete network of kingdom building services that we offer and we'll go through tonight. Uh, we won't go through uh, in detail, but we'll show them what they are. 40% of the ministries we work with today were the second, sometimes third, and sometimes fourth design team that's been brought in because what's been designed and what they've asked for from the architect, they can't afford to do. So they call us to help them figure out how can we do what we need to do on our facility. Again, we only design churches. Uh, S&B started in 1972. We are, we are the construction arm or were the construction arm of a large retail developer in Indianapolis, Indiana, Skinner and Broadbent. They, they would purchase land, develop it, strip malls, you name it, restaurants. They did all of that, big malls, up to a half a million square feet. Well, not only did they do that, but they also would construct those facilities with their construction arm. William Cooper, in 1996, rather, SMB launched their ministry division because they had churches, a couple churches come to them and ask them, can you help us with our budget? We're over budget on our project. Well, because of our expertise in budgeting, in retail development, a developer will go buy a piece of land and borrow money from the bank, and that's all he can get. He can't go back and get more. So they come to someone like us and say, can you build a strip mall? Can you build a restaurant? Can you help us with this? And this is what I have. So I either do it for that amount of money or it comes out of my pocket or I go to the subcontractors that are working on the project and try to beat them out of dollars because he can't get any more money. So we were able to work with a couple of churches that were over budget and help them. We've worked with over 100 ministries uh, since we've been doing this since 1996 from traditional state of the art, ground up, you name it, we've done it for ministries from 2,000 square feet to over 100,000 square feet for churches in Indiana, Michigan. We've worked in Illinois, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. We became the exclusive builder for Building God's Way in 2006, which means there's not another general contractor in the state of Michigan that can share Building God's Way with ministries in Michigan. We're the only ones that can do that. This is some of our team, the founder, Dan Cook, uh, his partner now, Don Mahoney. William Cooper is the owner of our company and myself. William purchased the company in 2011. The owner of Skinner Broadbent came to William and said, I'm closing down the construction arm, you got six months. You can either find a job 
You can finish the projects you've got, but in six months we're closing the arm, the arm down, or you can take it on under your name. So William and Cooper are born again Christians. They serve the Lord. They are givers. They are tithers. Um, they begin to pray and fast. They sought counsel, sought wise counsel, and literally emptied everything out of their bank accounts and their 401ks to launch the, launch the, the business and keep the business going. And since that time, we have been profitable every year. God has blessed our business beyond compare. We've done more ministries and more churches than we've ever done in the history of our company. God has truly placed his hand because they give. They tithe on their profits. They tithe on their company. They personally tithe, and they support and give ministries around the country. So that's what God is honoring because of what they have done. Uh, they all have, I'll go back here one more time. We have architects, designers, draftsmen, mechan everything that we offer, we all have in-house. These are some of the services that we offer, architecture, construction, engineering. We have a whole supply arm. If a church needs chairs, we have access to, to chairs. And by that, what I, what I mean we have a supply arm, the only other company in the entire globe that purchases more Linux air conditioners than we do, Building God's Way, is Walmart. So we're able to go to these manufacturers and say, we're not going to buy just a few. We're going to buy a hundred. We're going to buy a thousand. Give us your best price. So we're able to pass that savings on to the church through chairs, carpeting. Uh, we have our own audio, visual, and lighting team that comes and works with the church. And we offer all of this to the church and say, if you want to access it, that's great. If you don't, that's okay too. If you have a better source, that's fine too. The only time that you and I are linked together by contract is when you choose Building God's Way to be your design team, then I will be the construction team. So that's the only time that we're linked together. We have, um, we have a stewardship campaign that is really second to none. Our stewardship campaign is awesome. It's kind of a three-legged stool. We have biblical entre entrepreneurship, and that's where we come in and teach the entire church biblical entrepreneurship. And what that is, it's just calling out talents that are within each and every one of us of how we can bless the kingdom through business. And what would that look like? How do we look for things like that? What is that about? So we teach that on a weekend. Come in on a Thursday, Friday, and uh, Thursday, Friday, Thursday night, Friday night, and all day Saturday. And we offer that to the entire church and local business. You can invite local business people to it. Then we also have a piece of that that's called planned giving. We want to show the church how people can bless the church today and bless their family tomorrow. There are ways that can, that can happen. And so we want to show the church the ways to do that. Our plan giving many times out, uh, will outperform an actual capital campaign because we can show businessmen how they can bless a ministry and still bless their family. And so those are part of the things that we offer. Then we have a, a, a campaign that's called Hearing from God. It's a very unique approach. I wish I would have had it for our church when we did ours about uh, about five years ago, and I led the campaign. It was for debt reduction, which is real exciting, isn't it, Pastor? I mean, that's, that's the one that everybody gets excited about. I wish I would have had this. It was very unique. It says, how about we pray fast and ask God what we should do? We don't want to see tithing records. We, want to, we don't want to do that traditional pyramid. We need one person to give this much and 10 people here and 20 people and the rest of you down here. We don't want to know that. We asked the church to go on a journey for six weeks to seek, fast, and ask God, what do you want me to do? And when we take that approach, the pocketbooks begin to open and people begin to say, well, maybe instead of giving this amount, I should do this if I'm trusting God enough. So it's a whole new, different approach. One thing that we also started about three years ago is our sustainable solutions. This is what's really got churches and ministries across America talking and exciting. We are showing churches how they can use their facility seven days a week, sometimes 24 hours a day, but also within that to create an economic engine that will fund their ministry. Because you and I know tithing and offerings are shrinking. And why are they shrinking? I'm a baby boomer. In about five, six years when I get to retire, please God, I don't know, but we're going to shoot for it. When I get to retire, my income becomes fixed and locked. My giving will be fixed at that point, and I can't give above and beyond that. Baby boomers give about 95% of the income that is given today in ministries is given by baby boomers, my generation. My son is a millennial. They give about 5%. They don't give to ministry like we used to. 
They don't do that. And the reason, but you need to understand they are a very generous generation. Their generosity exceeds my generosity. But they give to save the puppies, save the whales, save the trees. But they also give to community endeavors. If you can show this next generation how you can feed the community, how you can minister to the community, how you can set up health and wellness uh, affairs, how you can do all kinds of different things that minister to outside the walls, they'll give to that. But until that time, how do we get income to do that? So what we're doing is we're creating these sustainable solutions, hotels, senior housing, event centers, daycares, athletic facilities, and the money is funneling back to the ministry. So on Sunday morning when the pastor says, we need to receive an offering for whatever, the millennial does, sitting in your service says, I think, well, wait a minute. If I give this, is it keeping the lights on? Is it paying salary? I'm not gonna do that because my next door neighbor is starving. My next door neighbor lost his job. My next door neighbor needs help with their medical bills. But if we can create a stream of income coming in, that when the pastor stands before the church and says, we need to feed a family that just lost everything last night, millennials open up and will give to that. So we're creating different ways for that to happen. This is a church that we're working with, I'm personally working with in Picayune, Mississippi. They own 19 acres of ground. Couldn't build on it. There's no roads coming into it. They bought it before the bubble burst. The city committed before the bubble burst, we're gonna bring roads in, so this would be a great place. Go ahead and buy it. Spent over a million dollars for this piece of property. We came in and we've been working with them now for about 16 months. We're gonna place a three-story Best Western Plus hotel on the property that will generate about a half a million dollars a year donated back to the ministry to do ministry with. And the people working in the hotel will be people that attend the church. When you check into the hotel, on your debt, on your little nightstand when you check in, will be a card that will say, if you need to speak to a pastor, dial zero. There will be a live pastor who will be able to speak to you at any time. People will come in not knowing Jesus, and they'll leave knowing Jesus. So we're doing, this is kind of what the rendering will look like. This is show you, this is a retail site now. So what we'll be doing, the hotel will be the anchor, and we're looking now to bring on a big box like a Lowe's or a Home Depot that will take up the biggest part of the land. Uh, then we'll have, right now we've got three, but we'll probably have six retail outlets. We have a, a group that's working with getting those sold. So the, from the pad sell alone, which that's what those are, those are pads, they'll sell that pad of land. From the pad sell alone, we'll probably make the hotel totally debt free and that will generate about a million dollars a year back into the church. So that's just one thing that we're doing. These roads, let's see if I can, I can make this work. Yes. These roads right here, that road right there does not exist. The city of Picayune, Mississippi is so excited about this project that they just signed off on a $1.7 million TIF tax incentive fund to pay for those roads. The church is not paying for those roads. The city is paying for those roads because now that's a retail base. So that's part of what we're doing. This is an event center. Uh, we actually have a church, the Genesis Project is meets in this church. This is about a four and a half million dollar state of the art event center that the church just happens to be an event in. And all the other times they're having major events in it. Uh, corporations are doing events, weddings, banquets, but on Wednesdays and on Sundays, the church has complete access to this. Their church has now went from about, uh, from about 1,200 to now about 1,600. Matt Roberts is the pastor. This church that, that they have in there, this is all crackheads, prostitutes, homeless. They have no money. They can't give anything. But this, that's who this church ministers to and reaches out to. And now they have partners that have come in and to help them out. Now this church actually owns the event center. Before that, they were just leasing it. Now they own it. So that kind of gives you an idea. That's their, that's their uh, Sunday morning service. We do senior housing, athletic centers. Annapolis, we did probably, uh, it's probably been about 10, 15 years ago. The lease on the Annapolis Center, the, the, the basketball lease and the uh, athletic lease on this project pays their mortgage every month on their new building. Today what we're seeing in relevant church design, our churches today, what we're doing is designing them more with a community feel. Um, when we come into the building, we want it to be a warm, welcoming place. And we're creating things that we call third place. I don't know if you're familiar with that term or not. I've heard third place. This is a third place. Third, first place is where do you work? Second place is your home. 
Third place is where do you go to connect, to do community, to do life together? What were today's generation, my son, where do they go? They go to Starbucks or they go to Panera Bread or they go somewhere where they can get Wi-Fi, get a cup of coffee, sit down and talk and fellowship. What we're creating today in ministries is we're developing these spaces where you can create that type of family and that type of atmosphere, helping them connect together. Our third places today that we're designing are sometimes at least equal to or the size of the, the worship space because that's where life connects. Because what we're wanting to do is in some of these spaces, we're putting indoor playgrounds. Because where do young moms go? They go to McDonald's or they'll go to Burger King. They go somewhere that's got an indoor playground. They get their Coke or they get their cup of coffee and they watch their kids play while they sit there and do what? Fellowship and talk. Why not get them on your property? Why not get them involved in the church where the members of the church can minister and build relationships with these people? We want to see how can we get the community into this space other than just on Sundays and Wednesdays. How else can we introduce what's going on here to that community? Is there things that we can reach out and bring the community into? That's, that's the direction ministry is going to. Because we can't get them on the property, they never know what's inside here and what happens. They never sense the presence of God. They never meet Jesus face to face. And so that's why we're doing this. We're creating what we call warm industrial. Warm industrial is just open ceilings and everything is exposed, but it's painted black from your eye level up. And you never know. You never know that the ceiling's not completely finished. They call it a warm industrial feel. Our process, it starts with an on-site uh, uh, consult with an SMB consultant like me. This is the first step of many, many, many to come. This is just introducing who we are. Meetings we do, after that, we do meetings with the staff and team and key leaders. We want to get deep into the weeds, understanding who and what you guys are, your DNA, the culture of your church, to figure out how can we partner together? How can we help you? What is God calling this church to do? We listen, and this is key. For me, this is key. We listen to the heartbeat of your ministry. If I can't hear the heartbeat of your ministry, I cannot help you. If I don't know what drives you, and what God is calling you to do, then I'm just another contractor. That's all I am. But if I, can, if I can for a minute just hear that beat and know who and what you are, we can partner together and we can help each other. We understand the mission, the vision, the DNA of your church, the culture, and how we can help. Is a building for your program, for your ministry? Is it right now? Is it feasible? Uh, what you may want to do may not even be feasible. Let's, let's explore all that before we spend any money. Let's not spend money and then figure out, oh, well, we can't do it, which is what most ministries do. But let's, let's sit down and talk and figure out exactly what can be done. We do a financial analysis. We're, we know before we start anything what the financial capability of, of this ministry or in any ministry is. Because we don't want to do something and say, well, this is going to cost this amount of money and you've only been able to have this amount of money. There's where we get into trouble. So we, we take a lot of steps to present this. And then the final thing that after we go through all this and go through the presentation and talk is do our services resonate with your ministry? If what we're offering and what we're talking about, if that resonates with your ministry, then we're the team for you. If it doesn't, continue to seek God and pray and find the team that you guys go, they get us. We like these guys. They understand who we are. They want to partner with us because that is so, so important. The needs are always bigger than the dollars. We always have big needs, little dollars. And so we try to figure out how can we, comp how can we do that. One of, the, one of the phases that we do is a preliminary design phase. We call it a charrette. I don't know if any of you have heard the term charrette. Cities use it a lot. City planners use a charrette a lot. And all the charrette really is, it's a, it's a, it's a whoops, back up here. It's just an intense time of collaboration with all the leaders. We bring everybody to the table at the same time. So we're hearing from everyone. You have the architect, you have the builder, and you have the leaders of the church. So we're all at the table at the same time giving input and figuring out what we need to do. And it's a three-day on-site process. You see it actually come, you see your vision that God has given you actually come to life in three days. You'll see it to about 80 to 90% will be completed in a three-day time frame. Most architects around the country cannot do what we do. 
they're not taught to do that. They don't understand how we can do that. That's the biggest hurdle that I have to overcome many times in dealing with ministries is, well, how can that possibly happen? How do you get it done in three days? We've done it with over 800 ministries nationwide, over 700 of them nationwide over the last 20 years. We've perfected it. When architects come out of school, they are taught, we're God. You did what we designed. It's our design. You can't change it anyway. Don't, don't be changing my design. Our architects go completely the opposite direction. They want you to use them to design what God has given you as a vision for your ministry. And they never, they never say no. Now, what they may do is say, that's a great idea, but what if we did it this way? So in those, in those meetings, we're in the meetings two or three hours a day, usually in the evening. The architect's there, we're there as a builder, we're listening for dollars because we want to make sure we're staying in line. And in that preliminary design time, we get about 90% done and I'll show you what packages look like, what that looks like. He's got a whole team of architects back in Ogden, Utah waiting to work through the entire night to present what was discussed the first night. We come back and we show what's discussed. You'll see, you'll see some floor plans, maybe some elevations, and you're going to tear it apart. We don't like that. We like this, but we don't like that one. We need to change this. We need to change that. He goes back again that second night, works through the entire night again with his team of young architects. They are millennial architects. They, they graduated. Most of the architects we have graduated from Judson Bible College in Elgin, Illinois. It's the only Christian college in America that offers a master's architectural program. All of our guy, young guys come from the Midwest and they go out to Ogden, Utah, where it's mountains and skiing and hunting and fishing, and they never come back home because that's where they want to stay. So we get a lot of interns coming out. So on day one, we're going to be discussing the needs and vision. And it's, it's a lot of input uh, from you. And before that, we're going to do a lot of, a lot of fact gathering and, and spending some time with you before this even happens. But at that first night, it's going to be more and more. Let's talk more. Let's, let's get everything out on the table. But day, day one, he may come with what we call bubble drawings. And it won't be, won't be anything other than what you're seeing now. Could be, could be the, uh, this could be the worship center. This could be your kitchen. This could be your gathering, uh, your entry. This could be offices. This could be children or, or a multi-purpose room. But he'll come with something like that based on what we've gathered, the time that we've spent together. The second day, he'll... Kind of, he'll show a, a somewhat of a floor plan of what it could look like. And we're going to be talking about it, going into more detail about it. Then the third day, or day two also, he'll have a site plan. What all can fit on this site? Um, that's one thing that we, uh, we really strive to do is master plan the entire site, not for just today, but for 20, 30, 40 years down the road. What can we do here? What can be done on this site? What would fit on that? What, would a gym fit? Would a daycare fit? What would fit here? Because we never want to put something somewhere where in 10 years you go, I wish we hadn't have done that. And many times, probably you've drove around the city and you've seen churches that have a box here and a box there and a box here and one over here. It's because they didn't master plan. And many times you don't even know where to go in to get in the front door because you can't find the front door. So what we try to do is, is, is keep you from making that mistake. Some of it may never happen, but at least we know what can happen should you go down those roads. On day three, it's going to be a more detailed floor plan. What can happen? What is the sanctuary going to be seating? What can we do in the gathering space, the children? What is all of that going to look like? You'll also start to, start to see some exterior renderings on day three. This will be a three-dimensional rendering that will actually turn. He'll turn it around so you can see what the building looks like. Could be interior, could be exterior. So, the, so what the deliverables are for this step of the plan, you'll get a master site plan, You'll get a floor plan. You'll get exterior renderings, flexibility for use of space. We want, to, we want to design to maximize every square foot that we possibly can. We just don't want to create a room to be one thing. What else can, what else can happen in that room? Uh, preliminary budget estimate. At the end of this, it takes us about two to four weeks. We're going to give you a cost budget. This is what we think this project could cost before we even turn a piece of dirt. We don't, we're not even talking about turning dirt and putting up a building. We're talking about purely preliminary and schematic design. Uh, you'll get a closeout package that I'll show you what that is. It takes about three days for the charrette, two to four weeks for review. That's where you guys are reviewing it and redlining and making changes and it's going back and forth. So you're going to be making changes at that point, two to four weeks for our budget. 
and the cost on that uh, for that project is, is 17.5. That's your total cost. Now here's what, what you'll uh, receive. This is a sample of a charrette package that we actually completed. This is Victory Temple in Jasper, Indiana. This is our master site plan. This is phase one. Phase one would be a gym. That's what they can afford to build first. But we're planning for future growth. So phase two would include their youth, classrooms, and a third space. Phase three is completely, completely turning the sanctuary to seat more people, doing the basement, and noting that the gym now can be a banquet hall because that's something that they wanted. So that's, that's three phases. We do this with every single church we meet with and every project that we do is divided into phases so it can be phase one, we can do this piece. And if God blesses, we can do phase two. If he really blesses, we can do all at once. But what happens is churches, we're working with a church right now on the south side of Indianapolis, uh, South and Community Church, that spent a quarter of a million dollars on architectural drawings, a quarter of a million dollars out of their sacrificial offerings and time. We've got a roll of architectural prints this big. They can't build it. They called us after it was too late. They called us and said, we want you to send it out for bids. We want you guys to be our contractor. And we begged and pleaded with them. I did for a year. Let us, let us come in ahead of time. We can't affect it once it's done. Once the plans are done, that's all I can bid is what's done. So the architect kept saying, don't worry, we're within budget. We're going to be around four and a half to five million. We're good. We're good. We're good. Came in at $8.3 million. That's the bids from the contractor market. $8.3 million. Quarter of a million dollars gone. They can't get it back. The elder, the lead elder on the team called me two weeks after that and said, Joe, are you sitting down? And I said, yeah. I figured, well, he's firing me. $8.3 million. He's not real happy. He said, well, we fired the architect, can build in God's way, and your team come in and help us. Today, we're sending the bids out again on a completely uh, newly designed facility that we think is going to come in around 4.4 and uh, it's gonna get them in their building. Um, but that's, that's what we do. And you, I can't tell you how many pastors I've met with that have construction documents that they've spent money for that they can never, never build. And we wanna stop that. We wanna keep that from happening with ministries. So you'll get elevations, you'll get a rendering. This is another package, shows you, this is Charity, uh, Charity Church in Indianapolis. Most of this is gonna be exterior and some interior renovation. They want to change the outside complete look because when you go inside the church, the exterior of the church doesn't match what's happening on the inside. And they want the exterior to match what's happening on the inside. So we're going to take one of their fellowship hall that you look at and turn it into a more of a warm, inviting place where people can come in and fellowship together. Some of the exterior. We've had, uh, since 2011, we've had uh, ministries that have went through our, our uh, charrette design for our team, SMB, we've had over $150 million in budgets. Now what that means is that we've had ministries that have went through and they're all at different phases. Some are raising money, some are pausing, some are in construction. In 2016, we had over $32 million of actual construction projects finished and completed. We gave back over $1.5 million back to those ministries. Because what we do, we give back 100% of any savings we can get, we give back to the church. We don't keep it. We open our books and we allow churches to audit our books. If they want to see where the money went, they can do that. We have absolutely nothing to hide. And it's, it's one of the greatest experiences that I have when I'm able to go at the end of the project and hand 15, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars back to a church and say, this is yours. This is what we were able to save at the end of the day. Take it and do with it what you want. And it's, it's, a, it's a great experience to do that. We kind of touched on this a little bit. Building God's way. Uh, building the world's way is design build, design bid build. Have you ever heard of those terms? Design build is where uh, is this first one, is the second one. Design build is where um, the owner contracts a builder like me, and I bring an architect under my wing, and he works for me. He doesn't work for the ministry, so he has no voice at the table. He can't say anything, no matter what I'm doing. If I'm doing something wrong, he can't say anything to the ministry because. I brought him to the dance, so to speak. So he's got to work for me, he doesn't work for you. Design bid build is even worse. Design bid build for the church it is. Design bid build is where the church hires an architect and then they hire a builder after the plans are done. So they design it and they send it out to several architects to, or uh, GCs to bid on. 
whoever's got the lowest bid, that's who gets the job. But I can absolutely guarantee you that those builders have covered their, covered their self. They know where the mistakes are, they know where the change orders are, and they have covered themselves because in that situation, I'm gonna give you a number. If I say it's gonna be three million and I'm able to get it done for two million, I pocket a million dollars. I'm not gonna give you a penny of it. And the reason is, because I'm at risk. If it comes over, I can't come back to you and ask for money. I either gotta take it out of my pocket or I gotta squeeze the, the subcontractors again to get it out of them. So what we do is a little bit different. We have an alternative to it. First of all, we start with, with, with Christ in the center. That's the first thing. That is the absolute first thing. We, we agree together, we're gonna put God in the middle of this project. And we ask the church to hold, actually the church should be at the top, it should be the church. We ask the church to hold a contract with the architect and a separate contract with me. We want you to have those two different contracts because now the architect and I can partner together. He has a voice at the table and I have a voice at the table. And we're working for the church together. We're not, we're not at odds with each other. He's able to say to me, Joe, wait a minute. I think we can do this. Let me show you how. And I'm able to say to him, wait a minute, what you're designing now is not in their budget. I didn't, in the preliminary budget that we talked about during the charrette, I'm gonna tell him, wait, whoa, 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 wait, that's not in there. So now what we do is, is during those times, we've gotta make you aware that we only had $20,000 set aside for your AVL, your sound equipment. You've just increased it to 100,000. So now I've got to come back to you and say, okay, is this a non-negotiable item? Is this something you can not do without? And you can say, yes, Joe, it is. We gotta have this. Then I'm gonna tell you, I've gotta find $80,000 somewhere. What can we cut out? Because what I don't want happening is what happened to the church in Southern, um, on the south side of Indianapolis, coming to the end of the day and say, we're $4 million over budget. We're $100,000 over budget. We're $200,000 over budget. I don't want that happening. So if I keep you aware of it all along at each step in the design process, that's gonna stop that so that you make the decision. I'm not gonna make the decision. That's your decision to make. You'll find that we are a mission-focused construction. Uh, we have a team approach. We bring everybody to the table at the same time, our budget process. We do subcontractors meetings. Um, we have linkage, self-performance, and gift and kind. What that means, linkage is when we get to that point, when it's time to do that, to go into construction, when we get to that point, I wanna know who you guys know. Do you know painters and plumbers and electricians? I wanna link them to your project. I want them to be able to be, to, to be invited to bid on the project. I want them to be at the table with us because if they're a friend of the church, they'll give us a better bid. They'll work for us a little bit better. Self-performance is I wanna know what you guys can do. Is there some things you can do to help keep the cost down? Gift in kind is, are there, are there businessmen within the church that maybe owns a, a, a HVAC company, a heating and air conditioning company, that will come up and say, you know what? If you use my equipment, I'll donate it. I'll give it to the church, or I'll give you a better price on it. So we wanna know all of that. Ministry of construction, that's a huge piece for us. Ministry of construction is, it's where we come back and engage the church, we want you guys to be Jesus to the guys on the job site. We want you to love on them, to build a relationship with them. And this started because Dan Cook wasn't always a Christian. And he built churches all through the inner mountain region of, of, the, uh, of the West. And many times he would go and present and they'd say, thank you, Mr. Cook, for coming. We're gonna pray about this and we'll let you know. And he would leave the meeting and say, well, I, I don't get that. What? Why can't they just say yes or no? What they gotta, what's this praying stuff about? Until finally one day he came face to face with Jesus. Went to an Adolf Coors the fourth, visit kind of like a, a full gospel businessman's meeting, and accepted Christ in the meeting. And um, he changes radically changed his life. And that's when he he actually gave up his practice. He had a very successful practice architecture. He was an architect, developer, and a general contractor. He gave it up to his now partner Don Mahoney. He said, "I'm going to build churches." That's what God's called me to do. And Don said, you can't do that. You'll never survive. So our ministry of construction, he came and said, I've got these guys for eight, nine, 10, 12 months on my property. Why don't I tell them about Jesus? Why don't I just love on them? Why don't I build a relationship with them? 
that group of individuals is one of the most broken industries in our country today. They are alcoholics, drug addicts. Um, they leave with a, with a pocket full of money on Friday and come back on Monday and they've got nothing. And so what we're doing is just showing you easy, simply, simple, easy ways where you can just love on them, feed them, wash their cars, thank them, just building that relationship. When you do that, what happens is they start to give back. Walls come down and they start giving back. Every project that engages this, we see somewhere between. Now, this is, this is dollars saved that you never know about. It's not in a change order. It's not something that you ever hear about. But I have my site superintendents keep track of it because I want to know what these guys are giving back. Without fail, it's somewhere between twenty to forty thousand dollars per project that these guys just do. It can be very simple thing as moving an outlet. That's a legitimate change order. If it was designed on that wall and you want it on that wall, that's legitimate. They can charge you for that. But when the church just be, becomes the church to them and just loves on them, they start doing things like that. And then eventually you'll start hearing guys say, "Hey." My wife left me last night. What do I do? I'm an addict. Can you guys help me? There's where we want. We want what we want happening is this. On Friday night and Saturday night in the bar, because that's where they're going to be. Let's just get honest here. They're going to be in the bars. They're going to be drinking. They're going to be chasing women. That's what they do. They're construction workers. What we want happening is on those nights when they're sitting next to their buddy, we want them to say, let me tell you about this church, this Forecast for Life church. Let me tell you what they do for us. They feed us once a week. Just come out and feed us. They take time to know who we are. They even say they got a group of people praying for us. What better advertisement do you have than that in the community when you got guys sitting at a bar talking about your church of what you're doing and how you're impacting their lives and how you're touching their lives. Because what we want is at the end of the day, we want some of them coming through that door saying, you know what? I want to know more about what you guys are doing. I like what you've done for my men. I like what you do. I want to know more about it. That's why I'm involved in this. We've had about 3,000 guys over the last 20 years accept Christ on our job sites. And there is nothing better than that. And there's nothing better for you as a church, no matter what the project is, how big, how small, for you to be loving on these guys and sharing Jesus with them. Because that's what we're called to do, isn't it? We're just called to, to be Jesus to these guys. Again, we have an open book policy. We give 100% of savings back to the church. Our subcontractor meetings are really unique. We have our, we'll send out the plans and then we bring all of the guys that we've invited to be part of this job. We want to bring them into the church. We then have the pastor there and he shares for you know, four or five minutes. I know that's hard, Pastor, but four or five minutes. Just four or five. And he shares the why. This is why we're doing this, guys. And the architect is there, and I'm there as a builder. The architect gets up and says something to these guys they never hear. You've had my plans. You've seen my plans. You know more about HVAC than I will ever know. Show me where I've made mistakes. Show me where you know you can do this job better. I need your wisdom. I need your knowledge. I value who you are. Architects never get asked that because they're God. I don't make mistakes. That wasn't my intent. You got to figure that thing out. Now, what have we done? This is before Ministry of Construction starts. Now we've done what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah said, help me build this wall. I can't do it. Will you help me? We honor them for who they are. And without fail in those meetings, they sat quiet. Seven, eight. 10 minutes, not saying a word. Finally, usually it's the oldest guy that's been in construction, probably worked on the ark, will say, you, you mean that? You want my input? You know, he's got a cigar hanging out of his mouth. And, yes, we need your input. He goes, I've never had an architect ask me that in 40 years. I can show you where you made mistakes, Mr. Architect. I know how I can do this job better. We want that because we want to drive the price down. And now you've honored them for who they are, and now you guys come along and start loving on them? It's a whole new, we, it's, a, it's, it's just a whole new world from, they don't, they don't get it. Got to get through this. From conceptual to construction, it's the charrette, uh, the church appoints a design team. We have the BGW team, our team, weekly meetings. Uh, once we start all of it with the, with the design, surveys, civil engineer, we assimilate the MOC team. 
CDs go out to local contractors. We review all the bids with you guys, and they're ready for permitting. And then we go into construction, and it's just a seamless transition from architecture to construction, on-site supervision from start to finish. We manage everything, weekly meetings, ministry rep to uh, verify the budget is on-site. We want someone from the church involved in it as much as possible. Ministry of Construction, all the savings are, are, are returned. This is just some of the projects we've done. I'm not saying this is what you're doing, but this gives you an idea of, of some of the things we've done. Uh, this is uh, Northview Church multi-site in Fishers, Indiana. This church has um, eight multi-sites. They were in about, uh, average about 8,000 on Sunday. Uh, when you've been to one of their multi-sites, we've done three of them so far. When you've been to one, you've been to all of them. They all look exactly the same. They all look, when you walk on the main campus, you'll see it. It resembles this. So this is their worship. It's all on polished concrete, no carpet. It's portable chairs like you folks have. Uh, on, Sunday, um, on Sunday morning, there's a screen that drops down, and it's a high-definition screen, and you actually think Steve Poe is on the stage. To the fact that the first Sunday, Steve started coughing, and a woman from the front row got up and handed him a bottle of water thinking he was actually on the platform. <laughs> It's, it's that clear and it's that, uh, that defined. And then we should kind of, well, I guess you're not there. So, so this gives you an idea. This is, their, this is their third place. This is their gathering. When you come in, you have the information counter and everything is off to it. This is their children's, uh, their children's wing when you walk into that. This is going from the opposite direction. They have this whole place right here. Uh, see if I can, right here, all of this. This is in the main campus also. So it's just a smaller version of their main campus. This is their ch entrance to their children. This is their, um, it's kind of like a remembering wall. And it's very unique. I'll show you what they do with this. You see that bucket of, that bottle of, uh, it's like, it's little bubble gums and it's numbered 858. That's how many, and I think that is the toddler. That's how many weekends when you put your child in the toddler class at this church, that's how many weekends you have till they graduate high school. Every weekend counts. And it's above every door, and it's on all their campuses, and it goes all the way through. So it starts at baby, all the way through. It tells you exactly when you drop your child off, that's above the door, and you see that every weekend counts. That's how many you've got left. This is some of the rooms that they've done, that they've designed and done, some of their kids' rooms. This is Cross Point. This church came to us. Uh, we did this, I think, in 2013, I think, or 2012. And they're a very radical church. They're, um, they don't, said, don't design us anything that looks like a church. We don't want to look like a church. We said, okay, what do you want? He said, well, how about this? And so we came up with this design. Um, they, actually, they actually had, right here, um, when they opened up, they actually had a car come and park there and honk. He thought it was a bay where he could get his oil changed. <laughs> Kurt Walters, a pastor, came. This is true. Kurt Walters came out and said, can I help you? He goes, yeah, I want my oil changed. He said, well, this is our church. He said, we can't change your oil, but there are some things we can change. And he gave me some information about their church. So this kind of, this is a nice shot. This is, they call this the venue. What you're seeing there, those three screens, that's environmental projection. Environmental projection uh, takes takes two projectors, tricks them into one, and you can envelop the entire room in projection. So if you want to create the Garden of Eden, you can create the Garden of Eden. If you want to create Noah's Ark, you can create Noah's Ark. So all those screens are linked together. This is their, it's a very small church. It's only about 15,000 square feet, very small church. Uh, this is their gathering space. They actually now have uh, taken this out and done a more of a corrugated metal look to give more space. It's designed that in the future, we can expand the sanctuary. So we designed it with the potential to expand if we needed to. So that kind of shows you what happens on Sunday morning on their church in the commons. That's open seven days a week. Um, it's open rather five, six days a week rather, has free Wi-Fi and free coffee. And they're right across the street from uh, a high school and three middle schools. Fishers, Indiana is literally exploding. It's just, it's the fastest growing community in Indiana, it's just literally, we just got an Ikea. I mean, it's just exploding. Um, and that's where everybody wants to live. This is Forward Church. They, have, they bought an old warehouse, came to us, and this is what it looked like. It was an old printing complex. It was nasty. Uh, and they were very, very, very tight budget. 
came to us and said, this is how much we have to spend. We can't spend any more. And we were able to get them in for what they had. So this is what it looks like today. Their, their name of the church is Forward. That's their worship center now. Very, very compact, very small. Uh, they run probably close to about three or 400 right now. That's their gathering space. We had to put the carpet down because there were stains we couldn't get up. So we had to carpet what you see. Their, their information cart is cabinets that they've put reclaimed pallet wood around and it's on rollers so they can move it wherever they want. That's really big, big today with churches that are limited space is putting everything on, on casters. So you can move your coffee cart out. You can move your book cart out. You can move your information counter around wherever you want it. So that's, that's what they're able to do is to move it wherever they like to move it. This, is, this was, was bad. Uh, this was all little mini offices, uh, solid walls through. They, we completely demolished it, and that's where their youth meet now. This is, some, this is Northview Main Campus that I showed you earlier. This is the worship center that we, did, that we uh, built for them. Building God's Way didn't design it. Uh, they had an architect to design it that kept the budget just going through the roof. We had to revise the budget 36 times to be able to get this project done. 36 revisions because it just kept, it was a designer. He happened to be a designer on the Disney Imagination team, and he also designed for some of the Trump casinos. So his design just kept, you know, I got an unlimited money. No, you don't. We're a church. We don't got unlimited money. So it just kept going through, but we were able to get it done. That's their gathering space. That's their, that's their old worship center. This is Connection Point in Brownsburg, and uh, this church hired us as a GC. Uh, this is, is new addition right here. That's a 40,000 square foot state-of-the-art uh, children's space. Uh, we, we put a chapel on the back side. We revised, renovated their, their old chapel into youth, and then we expanded over here. We, they have a fitness center. They don't multi-site, they multi-venue. So they want everybody on campus on the whole weekend. They have four services on the weekend. Everybody comes on campus and they run about, uh, about 4,000 uh, at their church. This is their, this is their kids, uh, kids, they call it Kids City. So we, there's four rooms, um, let's see. There's four rooms, a door here, 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 and here. And when you go into those four rooms, I think I've got a picture of one, no, but don't. When you go into those four rooms, it's a large meeting room for the children, worship time. And then there are nine breakout rooms that the, all the kids can go into and have their own Bible study time. This is their Grand Plaza. This is their main entrance that takes you into everything. It's about 11,000 square feet. This is a, a uh, Southern Baptist church that we did down in West Monroe, Louisiana, where Doug Dynasty is. Uh, where the church that Doug Dynasty attends is only about three miles from this church. Um, but this is, uh, this is uh, Fair Park Baptist Church. Um, when we went to them, during the charrette, they said, we want something really edgy. Okay. Edgy Southern Baptist. Of course, that's, this is what we came up with. Not real edgy. So we came back the second night. And we showed, the first night we met with them. The second night we came to something with kind of, had a California flair to it. The pastor stood up in the back of the room where Pastor Ron is and said, I, I don't know what you've done, but I think we've made a mistake. This is, and he's the one that said he wanted edgy. And so what well, we gave, we thought we did, because no, no, you, you got to come up with something different. So all we, all we did is we, we actually just gave them a traditional red brick Southern Baptist church that's on every corner in the state of Louisiana, every corner. Instead of having the columns come down from the roof, we moved it out front to create a colonnade. We took this corner, tucked it under, shaped the roof of the, of, the, of the building and added this column here. We showed it the, th the third night, we showed this, and the pastor stood up again in the back of the room and said, now that's edgy. <laughs> okay, all right, we're good. This is what you want, we're good. But when you go inside of the building, the outside of the building is not the inside. The, outside, the inside of the building is absolutely beautiful. That's your worship center. You don't expect it, do you? It is absolute. Now, here's what's really cool. You see here? You see these seats right, right here? This is all theater seating. Those are curved pews. The seniors in the Baptist church at Fair Park said, please don't forget about us. We love our pews. Okay? So the youth said, we're going to raise money for that. 
So we found a place that made curved pews that fits right in their design. Where do the seniors sit? In the theater seats. They love those seats. They don't sit in the pews. But we do have pews in there. This is their atrium. Absolutely gorgeous. Has a double stairwell. Uh, just, just beautiful. This is what we're... Let's go back to that one for a minute. One end is their, is their cafe that they have. And so you can come in there to the cafe. It's open five days a week. You can get sandwiches and salads and set. And it's all glass. Looks out over the property. Uh, at the other end, so at the both ends, it's all glass and it lights. So when you're going, going down the road, it's called White's Ferry Road. When you go down the road, you see these two illuminations coming out of the end of the building. Back up one more. The prayer tower. That was a non-negotiable. The pastor said, I want my people to be able to go up in the prayer tower and I want them to be able to look 360 degrees over the city and pray for the city. I probably caused this because I told them about our prayer tower at Lakeview. We can go 360 degrees and people are in our prayer tower praying constantly for the city of Indianapolis. He wanted that. That was about... It was about a $300,000 ad. So we told him that, and he said, find it somewhere. This is what I want my people to have. And it's just a, it's an anchor piece to that building. It's just absolutely beautiful. These are just some stats that we're seeing in America. This is from the Barna, uh, from the Barna Group. I don't know if you're familiar with the Barna Group. Uh, they're one of the largest um, Christian organizations that do a lot of reporting and stats and seeing what's happening in America. Um, what we're seeing is from elders, boomers, elders is the um, silent generation, all the way up to the mosaics, which is the millennials. This is the churchless, this is a rise of churchlessness in America. It's went from 28% all the way up to 48% we're seeing across the country. The number of churchless Americans has jumped nearly a third in 20 years, from the 90s at 30% to 2014. 43%. Nearly half of all unchurched Americas see no value in attending church. They don't see the value of it anymore. What I share with every single ministry that I meet with is this last statement. The message of the cross will never change. We're not about changing the message. He died for our sins. That is the end of the story. His blood was shed for you and I. It covers our sins. But how we deliver that message to this next generation has to change. And it has changed with every single generation. So how we reach them and how we touch them with the gospel will change. That message, the cross, it'll never change. And if we try to change it, we're just going to lose. But what we need to do is figure out a different way to deliver it. And how can we reach a generation that doesn't want to hear about it? They don't see what we see. They don't feel what we feel. I grew up in church. I grew up in a Pentecostal church that we sat on the front row and we stayed and, and we prayed at the altar until it was done. My kids don't do that anymore. They don't want that anymore. But what they're looking for is authenticity. That's what they're hungry for. Many of the millennial generation today is thirsty for authenticity. There is, there is even a group, a percentage of them are going back to the liturgical church, which is amazing. They want the old hymns. They want to be taught out of the Bible. So they're making a, a switch and a comeback, but it's going to be what church is ready for that. Churches that are impacting their community. That's what this next generation is looking for, is impacting the community. How are you changing lives in this community? Not just in this room, but in this community around you that God has placed you in the middle of and given you opportunities to even do more and greater things. So that kind of wraps up a little bit, gives you a little bit, not quite a 50,000 foot view, but maybe more of a 10,000 foot view of, of who we are and what we bring to the table and what we're about. So uh, I, I hope that answers, not maybe answers, but gives you an idea of what we do and what we're about. Um, do you have any questions or pastors, anything that at this point? Anything that, that you heard at the conference that you said, man, I wish you would have covered that. Because sometimes I get a little 
move out there. Well, I think I think what we're really what we're about tonight is just giving you information to see do we want to continue some conversations? Do we want to see what this group can offer us, how, how we might be able to partner with them and what, what they can do with what we have. And that's really what takes place after this is you as a church and as a member, you guys talk together and say, hey, we like what we heard. Let's talk a little bit more about it. And it could be that it's uh, bringing in leaders. It could be doing whatever. Uh, we're, I'm open to do whatever I can do to help you answer any questions because there could be questions over the next couple of weeks that you guys say, hey, why I wish you would ask that. Pastor got my contact information, and he can, hey, Joe, what about this? I'll get you an answer. What about this? I'll get you an answer. So. That, that uh, what you're referring to there um, uh, is the, um, uh, our first steps, where they talked about uh, coming and looking at the land and looking at where you are and seeing what type of sustainable product might work out here. That's a, pardon? Reevaluate, yeah, it's a, it's a it's, we call it a first steps, which is kind of, um, uh, we've, we've kind of put it all into one, one step to see, okay, is it an event center, is it a daycare? Is it senior living? What could work here? Or is it just in a place where it wouldn't work? So that, that's a first step that we can take when you're ready. That step that you're referring to is a, it's a $1,500 uh, package that we bring, that we do all the analysis and put everything together, and then we, can, we give a complete report to the church. Of, this is what we see. And we, we're able to do that because we have experts in those fields that know what to look for. Yes, absolutely. Ab that, that's why it's a key. That, some, some churches, um, uh, we might be able to skip that step because we can look at it and go, you're just surrounded with everything. So we're able to do that. But most churches that we're finding today, because one reason we took this, this approach was we had a lot of churches saying, well, help us, help us, help us, help us. Well, they, when, when we say, well, okay, it's going to cost you $1,500, oh, well, we can't do that. Well, if you can't do that, then there's not much we really can do. We need to take that to be able to get you to where you need to be. And that's a, it's a great step to take, and it's, a, it's done by uh, Pastor Eric Bame and Matt Roberts, are two of the staff pastors that do it. Eric Bame has been in the ministry for 30 years. Uh, he's an entrepreneurial pastor. He's owned over 14 hotels. Um, he's on the project that we have in Picayune. Matter of fact, he's going to be an investor in that project. It's that strong. He wants to be part of it. Uh, but he brings that to the table. Uh, his church started out of a hotel in Portland, Oregon, and grew to about 3,000 and burnt down. And he thought he lost everything, and God's raised him back up again. That's a whole other story. But uh, his, his, his hotel was an old prostitute hotel where <laughs> prostitutes did their business. And uh, he bought it and was riding around with one of the police in Portland. And he said, what's this over here? And, he said, well, and they said, well, some, some crazy pastor bought that thing. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm, I'm the crazy pastor. <laughs> but God used him and just raised him up and uh, just did some incredible, incredible things. Yes. I'm, I'm here until you are gone. Do you, do you uh, incorporate uh, uh, renewable energy sources? Like, um, uh, you know, like around here, we don't get it overabundance of sunshine so the solar would be out in my way of thinking but we get a lot of wind so we could have a wind turbine creating the electricity mm -hmm. for this place we're we're not we're not a green company or a lead company which is what you're referring to that's what right. they call it but we are green stewardship so we what we look at is designing the building and designing the mechanicals of the building to be the, the highest efficiency level that they can possibly be. So we're not looking at, we're not looking at the front end cost, we're looking at the 30 year return 
on the products that we put in our in our building. So it's not necessarily what you're referring to as a as a as a lead or a green company, but we will, we are looking for what we call green stewardship, which when we when we get into that part of it, it makes a lot of sense in what we do. Linux. That's why we use Linux because the Linux units that we use require less tonnage because of the ionization of the air that we're able to return and not have to return as much and not have as much tonnage, although the cost is a little bit more, 30 years down the road, the return is much greater. Hope that answers. Okay, yeah. Okay. That's, that's not in the first step. That's, that, that's, that's once we have established that, hey, this is a go, now let's, 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 let's go after this uh, 100%. That's what, we, that's, what, that's what we do, that's what we did with the, with the property in Picky, is once, it, once we got to where we know it's going to work, now we went to the city and said, okay, this is going to be a retail base. What are you going to help us with? And that's why the city now has come back with $1.7 million uh, to help the church bring the roads in. The city, the, the church was going to do it, which could be beneficial to the church because any retailer that wants access has to pay um, a certain amount of money to, have act, to use the roads and to connect in. Well, the city sees that and they say, well, you know, maybe we want that money too. So we'll, we'll take care of everything. You leave that up to us. And we'll, we'll be able to, they're looking, you know, five, ten down the, years down the road to be able to collect that money. We're good with that. That's fine. I mean, it's just something we don't have to mess with. Joe, speaking of that, where was the church in relationship with the, uh, uh, with the property? With, with the property okay. about. Good question. Um, the, uh, the founding pastor purchased this land for a little, little bit over a million dollars and couldn't build on it. They are actually in a strip mall, and they run about 1,500 people. Uh, uh, Average attendance. Uh, they're a spirit filled, non denominational church, and, but they're in a big strip mall. They're leasing. And so when they couldn't build there, they bought another 54 acres, about 10 minutes from where they were, and found out that they can't build again because the Army Corps of Engineers has a canal going through there. And we're going to have to, we can do it, we're just going to have to work with the Army Corps of Engineers. So now they've got two pieces of property. So we came in and did a charrette to redesign uh, a new facility for them based on what their needs were, uh, which came out to be about a 45,000 plus square foot facility because he wants 1,500 seats on a flat floor. Once you hit 600, you've got to slope the floor because of sight line, or you've got to put the stage up there, one of the two. But we were able to do that. But you can't raise the money, can't get the money. So when we went to the sustainable product and looked at that piece of, this piece of property is right off of Interstate 59. The, church, the exactly. property is, lo is located between Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and New Orleans, and everything is pushing to them. So when the hotel, there's only three, two or three hotels in the area, and they're nasty, and they get, they get between uh, 75 and $90 a night, and they are, they are bad. Um, when you see hotels in the when you see hotels along the road and or you go to a hotel and it used to be a holiday inn and now it's a best inn or something like that they've lost their flag that's what's called a flag they've lost it holiday inn has said you're not maintaining it so you're losing so these other three hotels there's one holiday inn is not a holiday inn anymore so we're going to put a best western plus which is like a holiday inn suites that's the level that best western plus is um so that's what we're putting in there now so what we're hoping and what, the, what, the, what we're believing for is that they will, through, their, through what's being returned back to them and the sell of the property can either, or Padge rather, can either pay the ho debt on the hotel down or they can take that money and build their new worship center out on their new property. So one, one of the two is going to happen. It's, it's kind of a neat deal. Well, it's, it's, it really is for where it works. We've got a church right now, the, the church that I showed you in Northview, that um, their daycare and one of their new multi-sites are doing, um, uh, their daycare will, will generate around $450,000 a year given back to the church that doesn't affect their 501c3 at all. 
after everything's been paid, after, after the learning care fee, their management fee. Learning care group out of Novi, Michigan is who we use to manage our daycares. We don't let the church manage them. We won't do that because we want the church to make money. But we still want it to be an outreach and a ministry. And that's where the church can be an outreach and be a ministry to those young moms coming in. But you also want to make some money. You want to be profitable at it. And so that's learning care takes a real hard look. And uh, so I think they're, uh, after they take everything and pay everything, they completely manage it. All the liability is on learning care, not on the church. Uh, the church doesn't have to worry about anything, lawsuits being brought against them. Learning care handles all that. They are all that firing, all the hiring, all the firing, all the books, all the ordering. Doesn't come back to the pastor, doesn't come back to the church. The person from the daycare can't come in and say, well, pastor, they fired me. I don't have anything to do with that. You have to deal with learning care. We want to make that separation because that, normally that's what happens is they come back and come to the church. Well, you know, I'm a tither. Can I have a discount? And if you pull up their tithing records, they make about a thousand dollars a year for what they give. So I didn't mean to laugh, but that's usually what happens. And so the pastor says, well, okay, I'll give you a discount. And then the church doesn't make money. That, that is the upper level uh, daycare. We really don't call it, it's really not so much daycare anymore as an early, early child education. Uh, that's really what it's about. Learning Care's new upper level is called Everbrook. Uh, and the Everbrook uh, competes with like Primrose Academies, those type of places, but it's based on STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So that's something similar that you're talking to. And there, there, are, there are a lot of grants out there that for people, for ch it can be for churches that go down that road to do tutoring and to educate, um, uh, educate children. There are some federal grants that are available, you just have to know how to work them. I don't know how. But there are, there are connections that can be made that can help you do that.